Okay, anatomy students, here we go. Another uh, video here. We're going to take a look today at pectoral girdles or shoulder girdles, the, uh, your shoulders, the two bones that make it up. So our objective today is that I can identify the bones of the pectoral girdles and I can locate principal markings on them. So let's get right to it. First thing we want to take a look at is the difference between the axial and appendicular skeleton. Everything that we've covered so far has been what we call axial skeleton. Things like the skull, sternum, ribs, spine, all of that has been part of the axial skeleton. We're now going to be focusing on something called the appendicular skeleton. Uh, think like appendix, kind of think of something that's added to it. So the axis, axial skeleton, and then appendicular. And we're mainly looking here at the these kind of words. Pelvic girdle, radius, ulna, everything that's down here on the side. Uh, it's all in blue here on the picture. Um, but basically things that are attached to it. So we're, our first part of this is going to be the pectoral girdles. So let's take a look first at what is the purpose of the pectoral girdles. Purpose, attach the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. Anterior, that's in front. How are they attached? They're attached to the sternum. So you can feel your sternum at the front. Front, front attachment would be the uh, collarbone there. And in the back, posterior attachment, crazy enough, it is not attached. It's what allows us to have so much fluid motion with our shoulders. Uh, there is no posterior attachment. Just muscles actually hold your pectoral girdles in place. Alrighty. So two bones make up each girdle, the clavicle and the scapula, which is where we're going to now take a look at. Alrighty. So starting off here with clavicle, also known as the collarbone. You can see a nice kind of side-by-side -side view of these, right? Um, this is a superior view. This is a view from the underside. You don't need to know any features for this. Um, it's a very simple looking little bone. It is an S-shaped bone that articulates with the sternum and the scapula. Uh, this is the most commonly broken bone in the body. Your collarbone is the one that gets broken the most. And you can feel that bone right here on your collar. Uh, let's take a quick look at this. Uh, most common site for breakage is right here in the middle. Okay, A lot of the reason why it breaks is if you catch yourself with your arm, all that force traveling up your arm is going to get stopping your body, and this is the weakest link in that whole system. So this is kind of like almost like the fuse that's going to break always. Here's a nice little x-ray of somebody with a broken collarbone. Uh, not a very fun thing to have happen. Um, Sometimes use metal plates to re-stitch things back together. Uh, and this one, it almost looks like the bone is going to stick, start sticking out of the skin, making it what we call an open fracture. So that is what we call the clavicle. No features, just need to know its name, and it's the most common broken bone in the body. Helps attach our pectoral girdle to the anterior side of things. Moving on to the scapula, also known as the shoulder blade. A lot of features here. So this is a triangle-shaped bone posterior to the thoracic cavity. It's on your back. It's your shoulder blade. And most people know where the shoulder blades are. So let's start taking a look at some of these features. The first feature is something called the glenoid cavity. So let me share a little a story with you guys about a pitcher. His name was a Glen. Uh, threw the fastest ball ever, right? Now, the problem was, as a pitcher, he kept throwing the baseball, throwing the baseball, ended up working his shoulder over, okay? So we actually name this socket after Glen the pitcher. So you can actually see where this is located. The glenoid cavity is this region right here. You can see this little cavity right here. It's where your humerus articulates with the scapula. You see this little joint right here? And I just made up a story about a pitcher named Glenn. So you remember Glenn the pitcher? Yeah, that's that cavity he has, uh, the glenoid cavity. Okay, sometimes called the glenohumeral joint. All right, the next part that we need to know is something called the acromion. Acromion is this projection right here up at the top. We can see it right up there. We can see it right here. Okay. In fact, you can feel the acromion. It's the top, top outside point of your shoulder right here. It's a very hard. You should be able to feel your points of your shoulder. It's called your acromion. All right. Next point, it's called the coracoid process. Now, I underlined the A mainly because there was a typo here on this handout. It is not with an O. It is with an A. So coracoid process is this little projection right there. You can see them over here as well. You can see them right here in front here. And again, up here is the coracoid process. As you might imagine, a lot of people get it confused with the acromion. Two different processes, 
different muscles are going to be attached to it. In fact, the coracoid process is the is the point of attachment for your pectoralis muscles. When you do a push-up and you bring your shoulders forward, it's actually the coracoid process that's getting pulled forward to bring your shoulder up in front of your chest here. So it allows your shoulders to move back and forward. We're going to be learning lots of muscles that are attached to this, including the coracobrachialis. Let's take a look at another feature. Excellent. The spine. The spine is this long ridge right here on the back of your scapula. If you reach back, you should feel a ridge on your shoulder blades called the spine. Important landmark that we're going to need. Next feature, the supraspinous and infraspinous fossa. A fossa is a shallow depression, so this is one fossa right there, and there's another fossa up here. Now keep in mind, this one is below the spine. This one is above. So you can pretty much figure out that the supraspinous fossa is this one up here. The infraspinous fossa would be that one down there. Now the neat thing is there's muscles that sit there. For example, the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus. Let's go ahead and feel one of these muscles operating. I want you to reach over your shoulder, okay? Reach over your shoulder right where that spine was and put pressure on your, on your scapula. And then what I want you to do is take your right arm now, the one that's dangling down low, and twist it as if you're twisting a doorknob. And as you do this, you're gonna feel a muscle bulge right there, your infraspinatus muscle as it pulls on your humerus and causes it to twist. So that's a cool little fossa and it has an important purpose to allow that muscle to kind of lodge in there all nice and tight. All right, the last feature we need to know is the subscapular fossa. All right, now don't get these all confused. We have supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, and now subscapular fossa. This is under sub the scapula. And that would be not on this side, not up here. It's actually gonna be right in here. Or you can see it on this side. It's on the underside of the scapula, okay? So this side over here, you can actually see the kind of the view. That's the uh, infraspinatus, supraspinatus. Here is the subscapular fossa. And no, you cannot go and touch that fossa because it's like in between your ribs. Your ribs would be right here. So this is kind of the side that's on your back. Alrighty. So that pretty much sums it up. There's only two bones. These are the features that we need to take the time studying. Make sure we know all of these features. Good. That was a bad, bad line. Let me try that again. Make sure we know all of these features right here. Glenoid cavity, acromion, coracoid process, spine, supraspinous, infraspinous fossa, and the subscapular fossa. And that does it.